If you have a Bible tonight, please go with me to the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. And uh, I love Isaiah chapter 40. I, I, I hope that you do. I, I think some of you know that one of the things that I really um, admired a lot and one of the things that seemingly I got to collect a lot in the pastorate are things that uh, sing, symbolize the eagle. And I've uh, had a lot of those things. And um, as you can tell out in the foyer, we've got a lot of books. And I'm cleaning out my office. And I just don't have room to take all this stuff home. And so books uh, on the table are free for the grabs. And the pictures that are out there, if anybody wants those, help yourself. But again, we're just trying to whittle some things down here as we're getting ready in the last two months of our pastorate here. And uh, just need to get rid of some things. And I, I just can tell you that some of the books out there, I can give you no uh, you know, guarantee that they're everything. So we've just collected a lot of stuff through the years. And some of that stuff was from the Bible Institute. And so I, I don't necessarily, sometimes we kept some things that we wouldn't necessarily completely endorse just because of the subject matter. So just so that you're aware of that. And so just because they're out there doesn't mean that, hey, Cleveland Baptist Church completely agrees with everything that's written on those books, all right? And uh, sometimes I don't even agree with myself. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's just the way it is in life. But uh, anyway, we're, we're thankful for that. Isaiah chapter 40. I want to speak to you tonight for a few moments on this subject, hope for the people of God. Hope for the people of God. Isaiah chapter 40. And we'll look, uh, start the message with the first uh, 11 verses. And so follow along as I read there, if you would. The Bible says, as the prophet Isaiah, God is speaking through him. He says, comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, makes straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked ways straight and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. The voice said, a voice said, cry, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the, uh, the goodness uh, of thereof is as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower fadeth. Because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it, surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, and the flower fadeth, but the word of, the, of our God shall stand forever. O Zion that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem that bringeth good tidings, let up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arms shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. So we're going to stop our reading right there. We're going to look at a, a several other verses in this chapter in just a moment. But here's what I want you to know. The, the book of Isaiah, is, to me, is a fascinating book. And it was written 100 years, think about this, it was written 100 years before Judah was taken into captivity in Babylon. So uh, even though Judah's referenced, and if you read the book, you'll, you'll understand this, that there are references to Judah going into captivity, that God was going to bring judgment. And Judah's captivity uh, is, is mentioned as well as Israel's. Someone has likened the 66 books or 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah, the 66 books of the Bible. And if you know your Bible, you know that in the Old Testament we have 39 books, and in the New Testament we have 27. And, and so if you read the first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah, they really kind of parallel uh, some of the things that you find in the Old Testament. And then when you get to the 39th chapter going forward, it parallels much of what you'll find in the New Testament. So God inspired Isaiah to write these, the first 39 chapters to speak about the judgment that was coming on the, the nation of Israel and on the, the nation of Judah. So as we think about Israel, Israel in the north, and we've explained this on several occasions, and I don't want to spend a lot of time elaborating, but the nation was divided, and we, it really became two nations. And so we have ten tribes in the north that become Israel, and we have two tribes in the south that become Judah. And as we think of Israel in the north, it really, because of the influences there, because they never really got started on a good foot, it really became a very ungodly nation very, very quickly. Moved away from God, got caught up in paganism and, and idolatry, and so God's judgment came on them. And, and they began to fall into captivity and the, by the Assyrians in 740 B.C. 
If you have your Bible open, go to the book of 1 Chronicles for just a moment. 1 Chronicles chapter 5. 1 Chronicles chapter 5. Here we have a reference to that first beginning of the captivity of the nation of Israel. 1 Chronicles 5 and verse 26. And the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pol, king of, uh, of Assyria, and the spirit of tithgath Penezar, king of Assyria, and he carried them away, even the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, and brought them unto Hala and Habor and Hara, and to the river Gazan unto this day. Now, you may remember that um, as we think about the, the nation of Israel, we have uh, the two and a half tribes that were on the east side of the River Jordan. So that's what's being referenced here is those two and a half tribes as being carried off. So 20 years later, there's a second siege and the rest of Israel goes. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 17. Turn there very quickly if you would. 2 Kings chapter 17, look at verses 5 and 6. So again, we have a reference to the rest of it, some 20 years advanced from that first siege. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 5, And the king of Assyria came up throughout, throughout all the land and went up to Samaria. Now again, Samaria is the captain. Lizzie, you need to be seated, please. Okay. All right, find your seat, honey. Okay. Chip, you may want to help her, okay? All right. There you go. Okay. Very good. Okay, very good. All right. So the king of Assyria came up and he besieged uh, Samaria. Samaria was the cap capital of Israel. And, and he besieged it three years according to this text. And in the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria, he took Samaria and carried Israel away into to Assyria and placed them in Hala, Habar, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. So as we think about that, I want you to understand that once they went into captivity, that realm of, of those folks, some of them may have filtered back, but for the most part, those 10 tribes that were taken away captive, I mean, they just kind of got filtered out throughout the world. And so, uh, again, as we think about what happened in 1948 with the reestablishment of Israel, and you see this, this kind of resurgence of the rebuilding, and, and Jews from all over the world are coming back. Some of those would, would trace their lineage to this, this, these 10 tribes here in the north. And so, uh, again, that, that was the beginning. And so we're told a little bit later, the same Assyria came against Judah. You remember when Hezekiah was the king of Judah, and, and he was besieged for a while, and, and God obviously allowed them to, uh, to hold that off. But we read in 2 Kings chapter 17 why Israel got carried away. Look at you would a little bit later, if you're still there in 2 Kings, look at verses 15 to 18, and he lists the reasons that, that Israel got carried away. Uh, he said, and they rejected his statutes, this is the nation of Israel, they rejected his statutes, his covenant that he made with their fathers, and his, and his testimonies, which he testified against them, and they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord and to provoke him to, to anger." Now here's the statement. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight and there was none left but the tribe of Judah only. So here's God's indictment. So you want to know why I took them away? Here it is. Here's the list. Here's the catalog of things that, that we're dealing with. So as I mentioned, several years later, Hezekiah faced the same thing but God withheld the judgment. So, but we find that in 605 B.C. that Judah began the three remnants or the three moves of Judah being carried away by the Babylonians. So you have both Israel in the north and Judah in the south both facing the judgment of God. They're both dealing with the fallout of God. So this 40th chapter, so if, if you take the first 39 chapters, he really deals or delineates on those, those judgments that have come. That, that Israel was, was, was being judged and Judah was going to be judged. Now this 40th chapter begins a new section uh, and a new element. So it mirrors the grace of God that we find in the New Testament. Think about this. God has a willingness to pardon his people and, and to comfort them. So as we consider our text, we see that it opens up with God doing exactly that. Look at verse number one. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith my God, or saith your God. So, so as we think about that, here's God saying, I, I want you to do this. My, my people have been judged, and they need to be comforted. And, and they're going to be judged, and they're going to need comfort. And, and so he's speaking these words of comfort. This passage is also prophetic, because we see a little bit later on, just a couple of verses here, that, 
it, it really talks about John the Baptist coming as the forerunner of Jesus Christ. So, so I want you to think about what's happening for just a moment. Think about Israel, the north, the 10 tribes. They are in captivity with the Assyrians. Judah's gonna be taken into captivity. They're gonna deal 70 years in Babylon. And it's been Isaiah's ministry to point out these things. Okay, here's the reason that this is happening. This is why you're in captivity, and this is the reason you're gonna go into captivity. And so it's, it's all about the, the judgment that, that that's gonna, has either fallen or will fall. So, so now you're living in a time and you're experiencing these things. So, so I want you to put yourself in the mindset of, of the Hebrew people. All right, here, we, we're, we've been judged. Here's another group, another nation's gonna be judged. And so it would be, you get to the point where you'd be a little bit discouraged because of the judgment of God that has fallen out. So, so here in this chapter, we find God sending here this message to the prophet to the nation. And it's this, as if he's saying, I want you to know, but more importantly, God wants you to know that he wants you to know that he hasn't forgotten you. Now, now you know, there's a, there's a, a time when you're in a, a time of difficulty. You know, we've all probably faced some difficulties in our life. Sometimes it's self-inflicted by some of the dumb things that we do as people. Sometimes it's just the chastening of the Lord because of our foolishness. But other times, it's the testing of God. In other words, God allows tests to come upon us. It could be a health test. It could be a financial test. It could be a family issue that you're dealing with. And I'm just simply saying, we, we look at those things, and when you're in the throes of it, and you're crying out to God, say, God, you got to do something. And it's almost as if God is not speaking, as almost as if he's silent. And there becomes, a, sometimes, if we're not careful, we have a level of frustration, don't we? Where's God in all of this? Uh, where's my help? Have you forgotten about me? Have you forsaken me? Have you forgot all about me? And, and so you can imagine these people are thinking that, okay, okay, we did bring this on ourselves. We, we did bring on the judgment of God because we neglected him. We, we disregarded him. We did not worship him according to the covenant that he established with, with us that we agreed to, and we entered into this covenant. Now here we are. We're facing all this judgment. What hope is there? Where's our encouragement? Where's our hope? And so God steps into the picture and he begins to give hope here in this particular passage. So as you're going through some difficult times, and I, I, I know, I, I think to myself, you know you're gonna be judged because of an accumulated sin. However, God is saying, I know, I, have, I, I, know, I want you to know that I have a plan for you. I'm gonna take care of it. And so it, it's really amazing. So we have to admit, and, and Again, as I look at the clock, it gets away from us very quickly, but let me just simply say, we have to admit sometimes that we live in our world and we wonder how much darker and how much more difficult can our world get? You know, I've seen a lot of things happen here in my lifetime, in, in the 41 years of ministry at the Cliff Baptist Church. Pastor Thompson's been in heaven for a number of years now, nine years this coming June, said to me before I became pastor, he said, son, I can hear still him say, son, you're gonna deal with things I never even thought about. And I'm looking at my son, I'm saying, son, you're gonna deal with things I haven't even thought about. And I'm just simply saying that as we look at our world and it's progressing, and we look at things that are happening in the United States of America, we scratch our head and we say, my goodness, how much longer? I said to my wife yesterday as a, a result of the news of the new elected mayor of Chicago, openly gay, Openly, just flat out, do what you want to, you know. And I said to her, I said, we are now, and we have been for a while, but we are now living in the days of Noah and the days of Lot. And the Bible tells us that when those things begin to happen, that we can begin to understand that our time here is not long. But sometimes we don't know how long that time is. You know? So none of us know how much time we have, but we can get discouraged. We can, be, we can be come to the point we say, well, where is our, our hope or where's our help? And so I want us to, to look at what God says here to this nation. And we're gonna deal with this very much, very quickly tonight, the hope for the people of God. What is it? We, well, we find it here. And it's, it, so he says, I want you to comfort my people. And, and so I can just imagine them saying, okay, all right, you're gonna comfort us and we know about this God, all we know about is his judgment, and he's promising us some things in the future, but how do we know? How do we know he's gonna deliver? How do we know who he, what, 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 some things about him? Where do we find hope? Well, if we're gonna have hope in God, I want you to notice, number one, we must recognize who our God is. We must recognize who he is. In verses 12 to 27, we find 
a beginning in these, these verses, we find seven comparisons where God says, this is who I am. This is what I'm like. This is, this is the God that you worship. And I, I think it's good for us to know how big our God is. You, you may be sitting here today, you say, man, I'm struggling. I need, I need God to do something. I want to tell you something. You, you, you serve a big God. You, your, God your God is almighty God. He is all-powerful God. And, and, and he lays out here in these verses how big he is and how great he is. And I'm telling you, when you start to think about that, that gives you hope. Amen. Now notice very quickly, let's not run through these things. First of all, he is greater than the creation. Look at verse 12. He says in verse number 12, who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out the heavens with a span and com- com- uh, uh, and uh, comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in the scales and the hills in a balance. Now stop for just a moment and see what he's, he's saying. These are rhetorical questions. He's saying, who has done this? Well, of course the answer is him. He's done this. He, he's so mighty that he could hold all the water. Th- think about this. We have a great lake. It's Lake Erie. It's the smallest of all the great lakes. It's, it's I think, 80 feet deep at its deepest point but it's still called one of the Great Lakes. There are five of them. So when I think about just the water in Lake Erie, that's a pretty big body of water. 55 miles across from the north shore of of Cleveland to the south shore of Ontario, and I think it's about 80 or, no, I'm sorry, it's gotta be more than that, probably 100 and maybe, maybe 200 and some miles long. 80 feet deep, that's a lot of water. Put the five Great Lakes together, put the oceans together, the, the Pacific and the Atlantic, add the Mediterranean Sea and all the bodies of water that are found in the United States of America and all the other countries, and God says, look, I can hold it in my hand. That's how big I am. I can hold it in my hand and it means nothing to me. Then he goes on to say, as he, as he talks about it, he's so awesome that the vast expanse of the universe is small enough to be measured in the span of his hand. So, you know, when you think about the span of your hand, it's, it's, it's this. This is what he's talking about, the span of your hand. And God said, I'm telling you, that universe that has billions and billions of stars that are made up of galaxies and that are million, millions of light years away, uh, he said, I'm telling you, I, it's like the span of my hand. And, and then he ma- makes, I can, I can take all the dust and the dirt in the earth like you put a, a little scoop in your flower. You know, just, just run a, a cup in, in your flower. He said, that's how big I am. I can hold all of that in my hand. And, and then he says, I can, I can take all the mountains and the hills, and, and I can weigh them on a balance. Now, I'm telling you, that's a big God. <laughs> that's an almighty God. That's a powerful God. And I find hope in the fact that I serve a God like that. Notice, secondly, in, in verses 13 and 14, he's greater than any human mind. Look, look what he says in verse 13. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord, or or being his counselor have taught him. So in other words, who has to give God guidance? Who has to counsel God? Well, the answer to that, of course, is no one. No one could teach him anything. He's all-knowing. No one has to give him direction because he knows everything. I'm just simply saying, he, he is that kind of God. Who can give him insight or teach him? Look at verse number uh, uh, 14. With, who, uh, with whom took he counsel, or who instructed him, or taught him in the path of judgment, or taught him in knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? Your God has, has it all together. He, he's an almighty, all-powerful, uh, omniscient, uh, omnipotent, uh, omnipresent God. He's that kind of God, and he's amazing. And so uh, Isaiah's pointing that. Notice that God is greater than all the mighty nations, verses 15 through 17. He says, behold, the nations, behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket. They are counted as small dust as the balance, and behold, he take up the isles of the the sea as a very little thing. So so think about uh, the United States of America. Our our nation, um, you know, I think 300, maybe 60, 370 million people. We probably have an army, our armed armed forces, I don't know exactly the totals, but probably over a million million people in our armed forces, and we think about the mighty ships that sail the sea that, that are part of the, the fleet of, of the United States of America. We think about all the air, aircraft that are part of our arsenal, and we think about all the weapons. Then we add China to that, we add India, all these popula- populated countries, and, and God says, I want to tell you something, they're but a drop in the bucket. You go out in your, your, your yard, you're going to do some yard work, and you, you take your bucket along, just put, a, just put some, uh, you know, some of the weeds, and you drop it in the bucket. That's how God says, hey, you know, these people sitting down here shaking their fists at me, he said, it's, just, it, it's nothing. 
Just let it drop in the bucket. Take them all. T- take all the, the nations that are threatening or shaking their fists at God. He says, as a drop in the bucket. He says, there's nobody greater. Then he's, he's greater than the human mind. We, we, we see that. He's greater than the mighty nations, verses 15 and 17. God is much greater than any image or, uh, or uh, 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 of God that man can come up with. We find that in verses 18 to 21. He said, look, go ahead. Uh, you, you make these images, but he said, what can, what can, how can they possibly get my likeness? How can they possibly come up with a, uh, an image that would fit me? That's what he says in those verses. And then he says, God is greater than all the collective people of the earth, verses 22 to 24. God looks at this earth from his lofty position. He sees humanity as bugs. Think about that. He sees us as grasshoppers. Here we are, we're just little grasshoppers popping around down here. You see all these guys, you know, sit on their, their, their you know, Mr. Putin over there in Russia and, and uh, the guy in Iran and all these people, you know, think they're so high and mighty. God says, you're nothing but a little grasshopper. You know, I, I just, it, it's amazing how great and how powerful our God is. And, and then notice, he, he's greater than any being on the earth, verses 25 to 26. And th- th- then finally, he's greater than, or so great, nothing can be hid from him or exhaust or tire him, verses 27 and 28. Now, I, I want to, just really wrap this up very quickly, and I want you to look at, if you would, so we see who our God is. That, that ought to give us hope, but I want you to notice that this great God then makes a promise in verses 29 to 31. What are those promises? Well, notice what he says there in verse number 29 to 31. He says, he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fa- fa- fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So here we have the promise of this mighty God to his people. Now let me give you those three promises very quickly that we find in this text. Notice, first of all, there's a promise for energy. There's a promise for energy in verses 29 and 30. He says, uh, he giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increaseth strength. So, you know, you, you say, man, sometimes I just get weary in, in doing well. Well, we do. But if we wait upon the Lord, the Bible says he'll renew our strength. You know, sometimes it, ministry can be weary. Some of you perhaps ministering this last weekend in a Sunday school class, and, and maybe you think, my goodness, I don't know how, you know, the bus route's tough, or my, my Sunday school class is tough. I didn't feel like I really connected, and I, I, sometimes I just feel so, so tired. Maybe, maybe you're tired singing in the choir. Say, man, I've been singing that choir for years. Keep on singing. Why? Because our God can increase our strength. He can renew our our strength. He can renew our energy if we wait upon him. So we have a promise of energy. Notice, secondly, we have a promise of elevation. Look at that in verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord, he shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. I don't know about you, but I don't want to just dwell here on this earth. I want to soar in the heavens. I, I want to walk with my God. I, I want him to, to, to help me to walk above the fray of this earth. I, I don't want to sit around and fret about things. I don't want to sit around and worry about things. Uh, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to be a, one of those Christians that are just constantly with their tr- chin dragging on the ground. Oh, life is so hard. No, no, God can give you energy and God can give you elevation. He can lift you up. He can, he can make you soar with him. He said, you can be like the eagle. The eagle seems like it flies and never gets tired. It just keeps soaring. And then notice finally, not only does he give us energy and elevation, but he gives us endurance. Notice he says, you're gonna mount up with wings as eagles. You'll run and not be weary. You'll walk and not faint. Amen. So endurance, elevation, and energy. God will give that. That's the, the great God that we serve can do those things. He has that kind of ability. And, and, and as a result of that, that should give us hope tonight. So, so as we think about what he promises, what is the key? What is the key here for us having those things? How do I get this energy? How do I get this elevation? How do I get this endurance? Well, the key is certainly given to us here, the idea of waiting. The idea of waiting on the Lord. What does that mean? Well, the idea of waiting is not losing patience, but continually just keep looking to God. So in the, those moments of frustration when, you know, it just does, doesn't seem like anything's going right, when it, when it seems like, you know, my world's falling apart and I'm wondering where God is and all that, what's the answer? The answer is not to run away from God or to chuck it all in. The, the answer is to wait upon the Lord. Amen. Keep looking to him, having, having patience, waiting upon him. 
We need to learn to look in our life and say, you know, uh, there's a time for me to stop and turn aside and to get alone with God. I, I need to get away from some of the fray of it. And, I, and I'm telling you, sometimes I think the reason people fail, sometimes I think the reason people quit is because what they need to do and what they actually do are two different things. When we need to wait upon the Lord, that means, uh, okay, I, I need to turn aside. I, I, I don't need to keep pushing on. I need to get alone with God. I need to see what God is doing in my life. And as I wait upon him, he has promised me that he will give me energy, he'll bring into my life elevation, and he'll give me endurance. We can walk with God, and we should. Think about that. You can walk with God. You can walk with God. I can't walk with the president. I, I, would, I would like a few moments with Mr. Trump, President Trump. I, I'd love to sit down with him. I'd love to talk to him. I'd like to pick his brain for a little bit. I, 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 you, know, I, I, you know, we were just in Capital Connection, and we tried to get in. So we got to talk to our Senator, Senator Portman for a few minutes, and we have never, in the years I've been going to Capital Connection, never been to get in Sheriff Brown's office. He does not have time for us. That's okay. That's his decision. But I can walk with God. I can walk with God, and so can you. See, that's what he's saying here, is that, hey, you and I, we, we have the privilege. Why would I, why, why would I want to, to, to mess around with lowly men when I could talk to the all-powerful God? And that's what he's saying here. That's where our hope is. It's not in anything that I can do or anything that I can conjure up, but it's in the fact that I have a God who is mighty. And so God says to Isaiah, Isaiah, take this message to my people. I know they're discouraged. I know they're downhearted. I know that they, they don't think there's any hope. But you tell them who I am. And you tell them if they wait on me, this is what I'll do. And I think we can apply that to ourselves in this time in which we're living. We look around and think, my goodness, it is getting dark and difficult. Well, you serve a mighty God, and he can help you. He can give you what you need. He can give me what I need as we travel through life.